Years ago, I encountered an episode of the Holocaust which spoke volumes about the willfulness and dedication of the killers. And I got to know one of the survivors, Lily Silbiger. I have a map here with me which actually outlines the route from Helmbrecht to Volari. Here is Helmbrecht. In the last months of World War II, as the Allied forces neared the concentration camps housing Jews and others, Germans emptied their camps and drove their prisoners on forced marches through the nearby towns and countryside. The death marches left a trail of corpses in their wake, and the marching prisoners were described by more than one witness as the walking dead. These are actual photos of the young women who were with Lily on the march. On the summer day Lily revisited the route of the death march with me, the countryside was beautiful. But in the spring of 1945, it was cold and bleak. Lily's guards actually had received explicit orders not to kill any more Jews, but they willfully defied their superiors. They drove her and the others, starving, wearing nothing more than rags, day after day through the frigid countryside. Sometimes we wouldn't even get food for 24 hours, for 48 hours. People resorted to anything that was found with it, anything rotten that was, you know, you just grabbed at anything. Um, and you were 16 at the time. Yeah. And um, in one place, someone broke into a pantry or some place where we arrived and stole some loaves of bread. And for that, they selected um, 50 girls and killed them over a mass grave there. We had to come back and uh, cover them. And there were many of them still alive when we had to do that. So they, you had to help bury them alive. We 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 had to do we had to put yes the earth cover them with the uh, with earth. Uh, so this was the biggest um, horrible. You know. Period. One of the astonishing things is that they were marching the Jewish prisoners literally to the last day of the war. Instead of running away to avoid capture, they stayed with the prisoners. They continued to deny them food. Absolutely. They continued to beat them. They continued to kill them. They continued to do it to the very end. In the spring of 1975, a communist rebel group, the Khmer Rouge, conquered the country. They wanted to turn Cambodia into a Marxist agrarian utopia, which to them meant destroying virtually all vestiges of modern civilization. First day when they marched into the city, we were so happy that the war ended. We were joyful and we saw the soldier came, there was peace come, and no more fighting, no more war. And then suddenly everything just disappeared. I saw a lot of soldiers in black uniforms close to my home. The soldiers spread everywhere, shooting guns in the air and, and asked, let's go, let's go. <laughs> Within three days, Khmer Rouge cadres emptied Cambodia's cities, forcing millions into the rural camps they called cooperatives but which came to be known to the outside world as the killing fields. Think about what, two miles per day, three miles per day that we could move because of so many people. And along the road, of bodies along the road everywhere. It just, it just, the scene is just awful. The extent of their violent transformation of Cambodian society still boggles the mind. And it was all begun by one man, known as Pol Pot, supported by a small inner circle. Genocide is always the decision of one leader or a small group of leaders. These individuals make a choice to initiate the killing, which in every case means they could have also chosen not to. The leader's goals vary depending on the time, place, and circumstances. 
Pol Pot wanted to radically transform Cambodian society. The Turkish leader Mehmet Talat wanted to secure Turkey's decaying empire. Adolf Hitler wanted to create a vast political empire ruled by the German master race. Colonel Theonist Bakasora and his fellow Hutu leaders wanted to secure political power in Rwanda for the Hutu. And in the Balkans, Slobodan Milosevic wanted to permanently redraw the political map of the region. As we've seen in Rwanda and elsewhere, leaders do not need sophisticated technology to kill on a vast scale. It is the will and not the way that is critical. In Rwanda, the Hutu leaders did what all genocidal leaders do. They tapped into the prejudices and beliefs that people already held. Generations of Hutu had grown up being taught that the Tutsi are dangerous and inhuman. It was easy to mobilize Hutu for the killing. As Hutu leaders did in Rwanda, the Serb leader, Slobodan Milosevic, played on beliefs his followers already held. His rallying cry was one that most Serbs would easily embrace. Under his leadership, Serbs would reclaim the land that they believed were historically theirs, including the predominantly Muslim country of Bosnia-Herzegovina. He exploited centuries-old animosities toward Muslims, whom the Christian Serbs saw as their eternal enemy. They knew everything. They prepared everything. It was really actually planned and systematic, actually systematically planned, the war of uh, actually establishing concentration camps, uh, killing, uh, raping, everything. Raping is one of the worst crimes. It not only humiliates the person, it destroys the family. Mm -hmm. you, uh, there is uh, so many cases of unwanted children. The, the mother doesn't recognize her son or her daughter that came from these rapings. The Serbs' widespread raping of Bosnian women was not the kind of thing, as many think, that happens inevitably in war zones. They did nothing, actually, hasn't done anything. Like killing, the Serbs uh, used rape and rape camps as an integral component of their campaign to rid the country of its Muslim population. We will never find out how many women were raped all over Bosnia. They actually closed us in some big rooms with maybe 14 beds. They are yelling at us, you will have Serbian baby, Serbian children. They were beaten, horrible beaten, with fist, with actually their legs and horrible. Our politicians may fail to learn from history, but there is ample evidence that mass murderers have learned quite well. The Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir has been accused of masterminding a campaign of genocide in Darfur. Twenty it's years the before the recent crisis in Darfur, the same Sudanese government killed and expelled even more people in southern Sudan. 
After killing two million then, the Sudanese leader Omar al-Bashir learned that the international community would let him do it again. Why does the international community fail to intervene time and time again? <laughs> 